For these six teaching films, I have with me six children from my school. Five of them have been here some time and are already acquainted with my approach. The youngest one, however, has never held a violin in her hands. Even for her, these demonstrations will be of some value, especially as they will be later clarified and explained to her by the older ones. For the older ones, they will serve as a review of what they have learned. In fact, I hope these lessons may be of use to all violinists of all ages. You all know this object. You have, I believe, spent many hours with it. I hope pleasant hours. It's worth the effort. First of all, it's a lovely thing as a companion, and it is even lovelier when it's made to sound. That is perhaps a little more complicated than it appears when a good violinist plays. And it is precisely with that in mind, with the idea that I want you to enjoy it, that I want others to enjoy you playing the violin. I'd like you to feel free as you communicate your own thoughts and feelings and those of the great composers who have written for the violin. It's with that object in mind that I have prepared these lessons. It will demand a rigorous discipline and a very exacting, precise approach on your own part. In fact, don't imagine that playing the violin is something that, once mastered, need never be thought about again. These lessons, I hope, will be concise and clear enough that they may enable you to return to, to the task, to the almost daily task, even as you get proficient. But always, of course, it will be easier with each day. My approach is based on a few basic principles. These will become clearer as the lessons themselves progress. At first they may appear not so clear, but I shall have to state them nonetheless at this point. We all know the principles, the basic principles that govern all technique. These are the economic use of energy, the smooth turnings between directions so that there is a continuity, the rounded corners, anticipation, which is extremely important, so it's not to be taken by surprise, elasticity, strength, speed, and of course, a quiet breathing rhythm, which is not upset at any time. But we are concerned in how to achieve these. And I have been governed by three interlocking principles as you will see in these lessons. The first one is to look upon violin playing in its three-dimensional context and break it down into the motions in each dimension. There is, of course, the vertical against gravity, which is up and down. There is the directional, as when we walk or draw the bow across the strings. And there is the sideways motion. Each one of these we develop and build our strength, our elasticity, our resilience in these. But then the second part comes in when we have to put them together again, because there is no single motion that occurs in one dimension alone. We put them together again into circles and ellipses to assure the smoothness of the technique. And finally, the third part, we have to build a sympathetic coordinating structure of motion in our whole body, which will support even the smallest of these specific required motions. Now I would like to illustrate these with an example on the violin. This anticipates our lessons actually, but may serve to clarify your mind. Supposing I do this figure with the left hand. This can be broken into its three component parts. The vertical, which is playing with gravity, keeping our hand at a certain level, and the horizontal along the length of the string, 
and finally, the lateral swing of the whole arm. Actually, even when working on these elements separately, we must never completely forget the presence of the other two. But we concentrate on each one separately, remembering that there is not a single motion that does not involve the whole limb from the fingertip to the shoulder blade, in fact. I will do the same figure slowly, trying to exaggerate each motion so that you may see them if, if you can. The very same principles apply to the right hand. If I play this simple stroke, this involves again the maintaining of the arm at a certain level, that is the playing with gravity, with the vertical element. It involves the stroke. And what is perhaps less obvious, it involves the lateral motion of the whole arm, which becomes quite clear in a stroke like this. These elements would not be complete even when put together, as we do into the circular and elliptical forms, without the third element, which is the supporting motion, the cooperating and coordinating motion of the whole body. This involves posture and elasticity. Now, posture involves elongation, that is, stretching, and balance. We all know that we can't balance a soft object. You can't balance a pillow. But you can balance a cane or an umbrella because they are long and straight. Now, the longer and straighter we are, the more finely balanced, the more delicately poised we are, the less energy we, re we require to keep ourselves erect, and also the more subtle and rapid are our adjustments to imbalance. This depends as much on our feet as it does on our head. To begin with our feet, if we keep them together, as long as we are still, it's all right. But if we begin playing, we might easily fall off balance. If, however, we keep them too far apart, that's rather awkward and ungainly because we can't shift weight from one foot to another without jumping a bit. Whereas if we keep them approximately this distance apart, we have a good base, solid enough, and at the same time flexible enough, and we can move weight from one leg to the other we can swing the body, we can swing the head, and we are always in balance. Now to go to the other extreme, to our head, which is most important in violin playing, but not only to think with, but simply as another part of our anatomy. A limb that has weight and that is very mobile and flexible. And unless we keep its flexibility, unless we keep the neck soft, we may get into trouble. Many violinists suffer from pains and stiffness and tension in the shoulders and neck. Its only function in violin playing is to touch the violin and sometimes lean slightly on it, pulling back, preventing the violin from falling away. Now, as to the general elasticity of the body, I would like to give you an example to prove how soft and floating the body should feel. We can start a motion in the arms from the body. That is not the way you would play normally, uh, though the body must always be prepared to prepare the motion of the limbs. But supposing it came exclusively from the body, the limbs would be floating, ready to move, and the body takes the initiative. in this way. That should be the background feeling of the body. Obviously, when you will play, you will not make that kind of motion. There are times, there are certain strokes that demand quite a wide swing of the body. Now, I would 
like to put the violin aside and we will begin at the beginning which means attuning our whole body before we can attune ourselves to the violin. Karen will demonstrate the first preparatory exercise. A combination exercise that normally would take, and I'm sure Karen spends at least 10 minutes on it every day, but uh, now we are only interested in marking the principles. We begin in the crouched position, where the body is completely relaxed, leaning on itself on the floor, the head is hanging, the arms are on the ground, and we take a few deep breaths, and on an exhalation, we straighten the legs, still leaning on the hands. A few more breaths, and on an inhalation, we reach the standing position. Here we check our posture and see that the feet are parallel, that the arches of the feet are working, the knees straight, the back straight, stomach pulled in, back straight and pulled back, shoulders down, head up, and we bring the hands to the horizontal position, breathing and stretching at each point we make, as we do again in this upstretched position on our toes. Again, breathing, we bring the palms together. Now, at the 45 degree angle, we work the arms into the shoulder blades, stretching them out and letting them fall back. We do the same in the horizontal position, first rotating the arms, and then one shoulder after the other, coordinated with the head, while the one shoulder stretches, the other one falls back into the shoulder blade. And both together, in circles, again coordinated with the head, head falling back and forth. Further head exercises, twisting, stretching back, forward, chin forward, chin back, and finally sideways in the Indian motion. And that is the first exercise. Thank you, Karen. And now Elizabeth will proceed with the second exercise, which already comes a little closer to playing the violin, in that it is based on continuous rotation. Collapsing at the waist, everything hanging, including the arms and the head. Uh, nothing is moving until Elizabeth starts a gentle sway, which induces a passive rotation in the arms. This is continued and maintained as the arms have to be more and more carried, but the rotation does not stop nor does the body sway stop. And gradually she comes into the violin playing position with both arms at approximately shoulder level. And the head too is participating in the motion, creating a kind of massaging pleasant motion, which should bring us closer to a happy way of playing the violin. Then continuing the motion, we make rotation uh, exercises with the wrists, remembering both in this down bow rotation, as it were, and in the up bow rotation, which is the, in the opposite direction, that the fingers have to also be passive and move in their own joints. And then moving to the elbow, we hang the forearms and swing. And then we swing them above our heads, fairly energetically, exercising the muscles of our back. And then we go into the full arm rotation, beginning in one direction. You see that the arms cross alternately, once above the, the left, once above the right. And that can be done as energetically as we like, in the opposite direction as well. It can be done also faster and with greater swing. And uh, then in opposite directions, I mean opposite arms, and in the opposite direction now, opposite arms. That's very good. And finally, into the figure eight exercise, which is down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow, as it were, in both arms. Each, at each point of the extreme up bow and down bow, the shoulders stretch, 
the back stretches. Also the down bow, that's right. Good, Elizabeth. That's fine. Now, I would like to show you a few exercises with which you may be less familiar. Can you balance on one leg, David? That's not bad. Very good. Now, balance is a very important thing for a violinist standing because they must never be in a static, firm position. They must always be fluid. And therefore, standing on two legs must not give them the illusion that they are rooted in the ground. On the contrary. And that is why, again, these exercises, and in the yogi terminology, they call them stork exercises, because they are one leg, are the best way of becoming aware of balance. There are a few variants to this exercise, which, which I'll show you. One of them is uh, this one. Back. And, uh, of course, one of the things you must remember is to pull your shoulder down with the leg. It stretches the shoulder very well. Back again. Right out. There is another exercise for people who stand a great deal, which is extremely useful. Um, that is called the shoulder stand. In that, the feet are right up in the air, and the blood is drained from the feet, relieving the pressure on the feet that we gather as we stand on them all day. And it stretches the neck very well, and it irrigates the head. From there, I'll go into the, what's known as the plow pose. That's when the feet touch the ground behind the head. And finally, into the complete relaxation. This well-earned relaxation is one of the most delightful states of being. It should always follow upon the exertion of violin practice, but it is particularly enjoyable when it follows upon the exercises you've just seen, because when we have breathed deeply and stretched and swung and balanced, at that time when we come into this position, the limbs feel their full weight. The arms and the head all lie on the ground as if they were glued to the ground. And it induces a kind of complete, uh, it's not quite sleep, but it is very akin to sleep, and in fact is a state of being more relaxed even than sleep, because there's no twitching and there's no tossing about. In this first film, we have considered and demonstrated various basic principles essential to violin playing. I have spoken of the three-dimensional continuity in which we work, of the need for stretching, for flexibility, for balance, and of the command of the space around us. I have tried to evolve exercises which would imprint these principles upon our muscles, our body, our habits so that subsequently when we speak of the violin technique we will be able to apply these principles to the smallest details of that technique. But it would be a mistake to assume that these principles are restricted to the technical and the physical because these very same conceptions apply equally well to the mind and the heart for we speak of stretching the mind, of maintaining the balance of our thoughts and of our feelings so that we may be subtly reacting to the smallest influences around us. We must remember that we live in this three-dimensional 
continuum and that our minds and our hearts operate in the same way as our bodies do.